So I just returned home from the ancient jungles of Cambodia, and the things that I saw were completely unlike anything else I've seen before. Gigantic, intricately carved temples that you could easily lose your sense of direction in, evidence of sacred geometry, potentially the use of hallucinogens, megalithic statues, ruined temples, light beams shooting down from the temple ceilings as the sun's zenith aligned with the temple, and even millions of landmines and booby traps left over from the Vietnam and Cambodian wars that claimed the lives of thousands of people and animals every year. This was a totally Tomb Raider style adventure, but before we dive into the mind-blowing things that I saw, we should cover the little bit that we understand about ancient Cambodian history. So we only have written evidence from the Cambodian people of the beginning of Khmer history dating back to just around 1200 years ago. This is when the Khmer Empire was born. Before this time, Cambodian history is very mystical and uncertain, but we know that their history goes back much further than the beginning of the empire in 800 AD because they are mentioned in Chinese documents dating back nearly 1000 years earlier. But we don't really know much about these earlier periods. What we do know is that the Khmer Empire emerges on the historical record around the year 800 and reigned over 600 years before its eventual collapse in 1431. During the early ages of Khmer civilization, the Cambodian kings were seen as divine god kings, direct conduits of the Hindu gods. It's unknown exactly when the Cambodian people adopted Hindu religion, but it was probably sometime in the distant remote past thousands and thousands of years ago. But it was around the year 1100 that a significant shift happened, converting the ruling families of the Khmer people to Buddhism. The Khmer civilization invented unprecedented hydraulic systems which allowed them to harvest a massive surplus of rice, which was sold across the Eastern world from India to Vietnam, China, Greater Malaysia, and even down to the Indonesian islands. They rose to prominence in the middle of an incredibly strategic trade route, which made them very, very rich, allowing the Khmer people to construct some of the most staggering pieces of architecture and hydraulic systems ever created in the old world, even rivaling ancient Rome. So as I was walking through the temples at Angkor Wat, I found these absolutely enthralling, intricate base reliefs that go on for hundreds of feet wrapping around the temple. They tell the story of Angkor's rulers and some of the mythology behind their civilization. But I couldn't help but feel that this art style must in some way must be some kind of leftover from ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Another thing that makes this artwork so impressive is the fact that these are raised reliefs. Most reliefs around the world are cut into stone. Think of someone drawing a picture or writing words in the sand at a beach. But here at Angkor Wat, the face of the stone was cut away to reveal the reliefs from beneath. This is a much, much more complex process that requires a much higher degree of precision to achieve. And I've only seen similar feats to this found in the Olmec world, the Maya world, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and even at Gobekli Tepe. So this really ranks among some of the finest base relief in all of the old world. Alongside this, I found the scale of the stonework and the monuments to be equally as impressive. Now, I wasn't sure what to expect, but the way these massive limestone blocks Blocks intricately interlock with each other consistently blew my mind. The craftsmanship of these temples goes so far beyond even the temples in Egypt, which are sometimes made up of gigantic, but sometimes entirely blank stones. But here at Angkor Wat, the level of detail was consistently staggering. Now, another aspect of the stonework that, as far as I know, has never been recorded or even acknowledged in Cambodia is the corner stonework that was actually originally invented in ancient Egypt, where it looks like the stone blocks actually curve around the corners. The idea is that this is supposed to provide stability for the structures in case of an earthquake. Now, I really have no doubt that this kind of stone masonry must come from Egypt through one way or another, whether directly or indirectly. As we were standing in this temple, all of us were discussing where exactly does the origins of this come from? And I mean, we know that it comes from the Valley Temple sitting next to the Sphinx in ancient Egypt, but how exactly does it end up in Cambodia? Are these two completely independent feats of stonework, or is it possible that the long revered and must have been held in high esteem stonework from ancient Egypt, tr maybe that knowledge somehow passed through Mesopotamia into India where we know that the stonework is absolutely impressive and then the later Cambodian stonemasons are inspired by the Indians, or is it even possible that 
ancient Cambodians were so wealthy that the stonemasons must have heard about this far, far distant land where this very impressive stonework was achieved. They send an expedition out, they check it out, they learn from it, and then they come back and implement these ideas into Cambodian architecture. I don't, with, with the massive amount of wealth that the ancient Cambodians have, I don't really find this to be implausible, but it is an invisible layer of the archaeological record, something that, that can never be definitively proven or disproven. But I just have no doubt that the old world must have been interconnected like this. And I, I suppose that another piece of evidence to go along with this is that tiny Egyptian artifacts as well as Roman coins have even been found in Cambodia dating back well over a thousand years ago. So there's no doubt that trade networks are vast, interconnecting the entire old world. Now, the true megaliths were a bit harder to spot, but I did find them, and I've never actually seen these documented before. Gigantic columns and door lintels were scattered all over the place, with only a few still intact. The floor slabs were also made of huge blocks of limestone. Cambodia is almost entirely made of limestone bedrock, so no granite was ever used in any of the construction as far as I could tell. However, we did find one temple standing alone in the middle of the jungle that was made entirely of hard basalt, which is much harder to work with and much heavier than limestone. Also, this lonely temple is actually centuries older than every other temple we saw. And I wonder if there was some kind of reason for choosing to construct this entire temple out of basalt, a reason that is just lost to us today. Now, speaking of the stonework, most people that visit Angkor Wat probably walk right over one of the most impressive achievements ever achieved by the ancient Khmer people without even realizing it. These massive bridge systems were constructed of the highest quality limestone found in Cambodia, transported from over 50 kilometers away, with each stone weighing approximately one to two tons. And if you didn't know, that's the same as the average weight of the stones used in the Great Pyramid. The bridges range from around 100 to 250 meters long and are lined with megalithic statues depicting beings and creatures from the Hindu pantheon. So far, there are 70 of these bridges that have been found, but there are likely more to be discovered in Cambodia's remote jungles and probably more temples to be discovered at the top of Cambodia's few mountains. But unfortunately, the major dilemma here in exploring the remote corners of Cambodia is that there are millions of landmines left over from the Vietnam and Cambodian wars that were planted by the military and rebels hiding in the jungle. Exploring these jungles in a search for uncharted ruins would almost certainly lead to someone being blown up by a landmine or hitting a tripwire, or maybe even worse, falling into a booby trap. Thousands of wild animals and people are killed every year by these explosives and traps. Now, most people probably don't even know that this exists, probably have never even heard of this, but the ancient hydraulic systems that the Khmer Empire built are among the best in the world and maybe even surpass the achievements of the Roman Empire. There is almost nothing achieved throughout the entirety of the old world that is as monumental as the reservoirs and pools created around Angkor Wat. Over 10 million tons of earth was removed to create the 3.5 mile circumference, 10 foot deep moat circling Angkor, which holds a staggering 53 million cubic feet of water. These are some of the only hydraulic feats in ancient times that rival Roman water and aqueduct systems. How exactly this was planned out and executed isn't precisely known, but the the Khmer Empire did have access to millions of workers and it's estimated that the empire was so powerful it used anywhere from 6,000 to 20,000 elephants to achieve these massive hydraulic and architectural feats. Now millions of workers and thousands of elephants may explain how millions of tons of earth was removed or how large blocks are moved from one point to another, but that can really only get us so far. There is no explanation thus far for how the Khmer Empire was able to lift multi-ton stones over 120 feet to the top of the Kokhare Pyramid. In fact, I went around the sides and studied its architecture, and I can confirm that the stones on top of this pyramid are actually the largest of the entire complex. It's obvious that the architects of these sites are making very specific and calculated choices. I'd love to know why they choose the hardest stones to transport and the heaviest of all the stones to sit stacked up at the top of the 
pyramid in the most difficult place to put them. Is there a practical or structural reason? Is the monument meant to be a divine creation? Or are they just showing off their ability? Some of these things are completely invisible to us today, and it's only by studying the aspects of archaeological sites that are very rarely pay attention to that we can notice patterns and try to find something that eludes to some kind of answer. In fact, these invisible aspects or invisible layers, as I've started to call them, are really some of the most intriguing parts of these archaeological sites. Trying to piece together what exactly was going through the minds of ancient people is extremely fascinating. And one of the most fascinating things, something that I have started to become fascinated with, is the idea of archaeoastronomy. The way that ancient people are interacting with the stars, the moon, and the sun. I find this incredibly fascinating, and it's alluring because it's not too dissimilar to ancient aliens. It's the way that ancient people are interacting with the cosmos. This was something that was not known for the longest time in ancient Mesoamerica. You had explorers like Stevens and Catherwood that are going through these ancient Maya cities, and they're not really able to understand why the buildings have these orientations, why they're facing each other or not facing each other, or why they're slightly facing each other, but one is sort of cocked off to the side. Now, the problem is, is that they were exploring these cities while walking beneath the jungle canopy. They did not realize that the city grid layout is connected to the stars. And at a certain point, it was once the Dresden Codex was deciphered and we were able to understand ancient Mesoamerican astronomy on a much larger scale that we unlocked the key to this new invisible layer of archaeology. So you peel back the jungle canopy and you start to study the city grid layouts in accordance with the stars. And it adds this whole new element of this ancient civilization. And as time goes on and archaeoastronomy has more and more people that become fascinated with it, we begin to realize that every single ancient civilization all around the world is taking a part in astronomy and interacting with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And it was here at Koker, standing on top of the pyramid, that we saw the sun rise on the day of Zenith Passage, and it rose directly in the center of the east face of Koker's pyramid. And later in the day, the sun will rise directly to its Zenith Passage, meaning that it is directly in the center of the sky. Now, this can only happen when you're close enough to the equatorial line. This can't happen if you're too far north or too far south. You have to be close enough to the equator to get a zenith passage. But on the day of zenith passage, the day when the sun's path comes directly above the Angkor temples, a light beam shoots down into the center of the temple. It's something totally straight out of Tomb Raider or Indiana Jones. So on our way to catch the Zenith Passage light beam, our boat broke down in the middle of this river out in a remote Cambodian jungle. And eventually when we were able to get out of the river, we had to sprint up the temple steps and I thought for sure we were going to miss the Zenith Passage, but I was able to catch this in the last few minutes of the Zenith. This phenomenon wasn't popularly known before my mentor, Dr. Ed Barnhart, discovered it nearly 15 years ago. Now, all of the locals in Cambodia visit the site on Zenith Passage to check it out, and I even got this photo of a monk meditating in the light beam. Discoveries in archaeoastronomy are incredibly difficult to definitively prove, but I think he really did discover something here, especially since fallen zenith tubes have been discovered laying around the temples. They prove that cylindrical holes were intentionally placed into the top of each temple, allowing light to enter when the sun is directly overhead. And when I saw this light beam, I got the exact same feeling that I got last year watching the spring equinox at Chichen Itza, where you see the serpent undulating down the pyramid and tens of thousands of people erupt in cheering. It was so obvious to me that this was something that was intentionally planned by this ancient civilization, I got the exact same feeling in Cambodia. While more conservative archaeologists and academics may just pass this off as some kind of coincidence, I have absolutely no doubt that these phenomena are completely intentional and that it's proof of ancient civilizations interacting with their cosmos and incorporating these sacred divine elements into their architecture. I think they're interacting with the night sky, the moon, and the sun far more than any of us give them credit for. Most of this knowledge was sacred and kept hidden in ancient times. 
It was meant for the rulers, priests, and scholars to understand, and it was meant to be kept a secret. So there's almost never any literature or documentation regarding astronomy found anywhere in the ancient world. But if you spend enough time studying the architecture of ancient civilizations, it becomes undoubtable that they are building their monuments not only with elements of sacred geometry incorporated, but also aligning these monuments with the heavenly bodies. Again, these are invisible layers upon invisible layers at these ancient sites. It goes far deeper than is commonly accepted and far deeper than anyone realizes thus far. Again, archaeoastronomy is so fascinating because it's kind of akin to ancient aliens. We're trying to piece together the relationship and interaction and understanding that ancient people had of the heavenly bodies of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and how they interacted with these things and what they really knew about it. And I certainly believe that they are so much more intelligent and more knowledgeable than they're currently being given credit for. And I bet in some ways, in many ways, they're more knowledgeable about their natural world and the cosmos than we are today. And finally, the sad reality of trying to discover more Cambodian sites and explore Cambodia's jungles is what I mentioned earlier. Anywhere from four to six million explosives of tripwires, landmines, and booby traps are still scattering Cambodia's jungle floors. From what we know, around 100,000 people have died from accidentally stepping into these traps, but certainly there are many, many more that are killed and never found. Even wild animals such as tigers and elephants have been killed by these traps. LiDAR scans have revealed multiple large networks of ancient buildings concealed by the jungle canopy, but these are made completely inaccessible because the regions are utterly infested with landmines that may take centuries to clear out. Not to mention traps that may have been hidden within these uncharted temples back during the war to sabotage potential soldiers who come looking for shelter. On top of this, unexploded ordnance dropped by the US military are still lying around the jungle waiting to go off at the slightest bump. I saw dozens and dozens of these unexploded shells, and even falling trees can set off dormant missiles and landmines. The sad reality is that modern day Cambodians are locked off from parts of their own ancient past because of the lingering effects of past conflicts, and everyday farmers are being killed by accidentally setting off these traps. But a silver lining is that a man named Aki Ra, who I had the privilege of meeting, has spent his life disarming and clearing the jungle floor foot by foot literally. So far, he has disarmed over 50,000 landmines, tripwires, and unexploded ordnance by hand, completely on his own. His parents were murdered during the war, and he was raised as a rebel and taught how to plant and arm the explosives himself. Eventually, he escaped, and he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to disarming the explosives he spent his childhood planting. I absolutely loved the expedition to Cambodia. The people were some of the friendliest I've ever met, but unfortunately, ancient Cambodian history is so under studied and so locked off by the effects of the turmoils of war. So, so many secrets and hidden aspects of their ancient past are just sitting out in these deadly jungles waiting to be discovered. The other downside is I was completely drenched in sweat the entire expedition and I was always on the lookout for a king cobra. I am beginning to learn that the downside to all of the world's coolest places is always snakes. I'm Luke Caverns. If you'd like more videos on ancient history and mysteries all around the world, well, please like and subscribe for more.